in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, enlighten our hearts to see the things that are of God. Come, Holy Spirit, into our minds, that we may know the things that are of God. Come, Holy Spirit, into our souls, that we belong only to God. Sanctify all that we think, say, and do, that all will be for the glory of God. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, well, today we're talking about the second last of our I am statements. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay. Now this was actually a really complicated uh, Bible study to kind of pull together, so um, I'm hoping it'll come out okay. But if not, pretend it did. <laughs> and um, yeah, we'll just leave it at that, okay? So, I am the way and the truth and the life. <clears throat> and we start off uh, with looking at the way, right? What does that mean when Jesus says, I am the way? And it's interesting because in the Old Testament, the very first thing we find out about is that um, there are different ways to understand the word way. Oh, isn't that cool? Okay, Exodus 18 says, Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. And so in this sense, we understand that the way, a way is a way of life, right? What is the way that you have chosen to live? Okay. But there's another understanding. Exodus 23 verse 20 says, See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. And in this sense, the word way is more of a destination or a path. Right? And so um, when, when Jesus says the words, I am the way, he actually incorporates both of these, right? And that's, that's actually kind of cool. But there's more, okay? We find out that there is um, kind of a, a preference that God has in terms of uh, action that is done, ritual action that is done, and how it is done, okay? So Leviticus 5 reveals Verse 5 here, when anyone becomes aware that they are guilty in any of these matters, they must confess in what way they have sinned. Okay? Which is interesting, you don't just confess that, that you have sinned, you have to con confess the way in which you have sinned. Okay, so um, you can imagine how long confession took at that time. <laughs> okay, and this of course is, um, remember the Day of Atonement, right? The great high priest, that was his big job on that day, to... to put his hands on the, the scapegoat and to confess all the sins of the people onto the scapegoat, right? Imagine, that's a lot of sins. And, and it's interesting because he can't just confess the sin, he has to confess the way in which they sinned, okay? So that makes a difference. And I think even for us, when we go to confession, that should make a difference, right? That should have an impact. But here's something else. So, so we find out um, that the way you've sinned is important for God, even more important than the fact that you have sinned. Right? You need to confess the way in which you have sinned, which is interesting, I think. And the, the corollary is also there. Okay? Leviticus 22, verse 29 says, When you sacrifice a thank offering to the Lord, sacrifice it in such a way that it will be accepted on your behalf. So you can't just sacrifice it and assume that it will be acceptable. There is a way in which to offer it, right? A proper way. And there's, the, so there's the right way and there's the wrong way. You, you don't just go through the motions and assume that your sacrifice will be received. The other thing that I think is really interesting here is, um, and hopefully we'll, we'll come back to it in, in some way, is that this is that statement we just looked at, when you sac sacrifice a thank offering to the Lord, Right? A thank offering. Of all the different types of sacrifices that they had, there's four of them, right? One of them, and, and I, would, I would suggest that one of the um, coolest ones, right? Because there's the Holocaust, right? Or the whole burnt offering. There's the peace offering. There's the sin offering. And then there's this one, the thank offering, okay? And the thank offering, it's interesting that all the other ones were ritual actions, and this kind of thing was not stressed with them the other sacrifices, but with a thank offering, because it was completely voluntary, right? So with a sin offering, whether you wanted to or not, you had to go and offer your sin offering. Okay, you had to. It was a ritual prescribed thing. And there was no attention paid um, 
in terms of the writings of the Old Testament as to how you were uh, supposed to be disposed in your heart, what you were thinking about or what you were feeling at the time, right? You simply had to just offer this, this sacrifice, okay? But when it came to the thank offering, okay, that was different because the thank offering was completely voluntary whenever you felt like thanking God. There was no time or date or place, okay? You got to pick. And it's kind of, um, it's kind of like the Lord saying, okay, I'm not forcing you to thank me, but if you're going to thank me, you better do it right, right? You better do it honestly and sincerely, and it better come from the heart. Because if you're just gonna come and produce a thank offering for show, right, when it's not required of you, then just don't do it at all. It's not required. It's up to you if you want to, but if you're gonna do it, the way in which you do it is very important, okay? And I think that means a lot. I think that really means a lot, especially considering the fact that um, th a Thanksgiving offering, a thank offering today, the, w the word thank, right, in the Greek, Eucharistico, right, and we've got the thank offering today that we offer in the Mass, the Eucharist, right? And there again, if you're gonna do it, do it, do it right. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, well, let's go on. Okay. Psalm one, verse six says, "For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous." That's one side. But the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Okay. So now we find out that there's, you know, just like we looked at once before, two different paths, right? The uh, the path to what was it? The gate to he heaven. Remember, can't remember the wording, but the, the narrow gate, strive to enter through the narrow gate, not the wide gate. The narrow gate has the path that leads to life, and then the wide gate leads to destruction. I think it was, but I could be mistaken with those words. So, in the same way, okay, right from the Old Testament, we find out there's these two different ways, and you're supposed to pick and choose, right? Which way are you going to go? <clears throat> as for God, I mean, sorry, Psalm 18, verse 30 it says, As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. Now, if we substitute in any of these statements, as well as all the statements that are going to follow, the word Christ instead of the word, right? Because he's the one that says, I am the way, right? Then we start to understand a whole new, under, um, a whole new emphasis that God has. When he says, as for God, his way is perfect, his Christ is perfect. Okay, Jesus is perfect. And, and it makes sense because the very next thing it says, the Lord's word is flawless. And who is the word? The eternal word is Christ once again, right? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And so both his way and his word are perfect. There's that correlation again. Okay, so um, that's the, the patrimony that we receive from the Old Testament. Testament, okay? That's what they've given us. That there's different ways to understand the word way, um, as a path, as a destination, all these different things. Oh, I should, I should mention there, <laughs> this little story. Um, this, uh, uh, this native Indian sitting by the side of the road, right? And, and a person comes up and says, um, where does this road go? Right? Simple question. And he answers, road stay, you go. <laughs> Which I think is really kind of, okay, that's true, right? The, the road actually doesn't move. We, we travel down the road, and, and um, I thought it kind of connected with the way. So, okay, um, okay, let's just move on. <laughs> no reason whatsoever. Okay, John 14. This is the statement that we're actually looking at. It. This is the source. Um, Jesus is speaking, and he says to his apostles, um, in, this is John 14, so we're, we are actually um, right before the Passover, okay? immediately before the Passover, and Jesus has these huge, this huge long discourse, and it goes you know, 14, 15, 16, 17, all this huge section of, of the Gospel of John, where Jesus is simply teaching and explaining and telling them everything. It's almost as if he's... Um, you know, getting everything in the last moment right before the Passover because he, he's got to get it in. There's so much there before they celebrate. Okay, and so this is one of the things at that last moment that he needs to tell them. Okay, 
He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. I am going there to prepare a place for you. I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? We don't even know where you're going. How could we possibly know the way? I, I kind of like Thomas. He's a really practical kind of guy, right? Um, and he needs a lot of, um, you can imagine, could you please just write down the instructions of how we get there and what, you know, and unless I see the signpost, I will not believe that is the way, right? You can imagine him saying stuff like that. Okay, and then Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Okay. Now this is a huge statement, right? It's a huge statement. Um, statements that came before were kind of, kind of interesting. I am the good shepherd. That's beautiful. Isn't that a nice image? Um, I'm the bread of life. It was a bit weird, but okay. We can go with that. Um, I am the gate for the sheep. Ah, okay, that kind of makes sense. But when he gets to this, oh, the light of the world, there we're starting to, to stretch things, you know, a little bit more. But when he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, like that is an all-encompassing statement. It, it, I'm the, the be-all and the end-all. I'm everything. I am the way. I am truth itself. Imagine claiming to be truth. Like, I think that's just phenomenal. And not just there, he doesn't stop there. I am the life. I am the life. He actually claims to be the fullness of life, all life. And, and so he puts all three together. I am not just the way, I'm also the truth, and I'm the life. So there, right? It's like, okay, like you can just imagine listening to this for the first time and thinking to yourself, wow, he really is everything, everything. That's a huge, huge statement on Jesus' part, right? And it's interesting because now he goes into something that we would call um, Trinitarian language. He begins to explain the inner life of the Trinity. And this is interesting because the word Trinity is nowhere found in the Bible. All right? That was, that was a, a later, um, the coining of that term came much, much later. But, but look how perfectly it's explained here. Okay? He says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Forever. Imagine. Okay. The spirit of truth. Okay. So now he's claimed to be the way. Now he's introduced the truth. You see that? The spirit of truth. You know him. Well, do they know him? They've never even heard of the spirit of truth. Right? But he says, you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Well, he lives with you. Jesus lives with them. The spirit of truth, they don't know the spirit. Of, they know the spirit within Jesus. Also oh, through Christ. They not only know the Father, but they also know the spirit of truth. And he will be in you. Okay, when does this happen? After the Paschal mystery. Right? It's it, after the death and resurrection, um, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. After the resurrection. Okay? He will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now he's speaking as if he's the father, right? And, and not, he's like, you know, normally he's going to be calling them brothers. I no longer call you servants, right? But friends. And then he goes to, from friends, tell my brothers that I'm coming, going before them into Galilee, right? After the resurrection. There's this progression as to what he calls his, his um, 12 apostles. So now it's interesting that here he says, I will not leave you as orphans, as if they're his children. So he's, he's speaking as if he's the father here. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. Okay, now he's speaking as if he's Christ again, because he's going to die and resurrect and ascend into heaven. But you will see me. Oh my goodness, now what? How are we going to see him? This is going to be so hard, right? He's going to ascend into heaven. Okay, because I live, okay, now he's got the third element. He introduced the spirit of truth, and now because I live, so he is life, right? You also will live. Okay, are you getting confused yet? Because I'm sure they were. 
I, I am just so sure that they were listening, thinking, oh my goodness, you say something. No, you say something, right? And it was like so difficult to understand. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me. Oh my goodness! It just continues to grow. Now you are in me, okay? That's what he tells them. The apostles are in Christ, okay? And I am in you. Whoa. Okay, I thought the Spirit was going to come into us, but okay, you're going to come too. Okay, wherever the Spirit goes, that's where Christ shows up too, right? Okay. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Now, this may seem like very confusing language, right? But, but it's actually really, really beautiful. Um, theologically, th this understanding that each person of the Holy Trinity is in the other, and that each, uh, each is the fullness of God, the fullness of God, the fullness of divinity. Christ is fully God, right? He's not part of God. He is fully God. And, and yet, Christ is in the Father. The Father is in Christ. The Spirit is in Christ. Christ is in the Spirit. All of that, one is, each is in the other. We call that, the sentence, the word that we, we give is circumcision. Okay, and I have no idea if I've pronounced that correctly, right? Circum, circumcision. It, it's a difficult word, but that's what it means theologically, that each is fully in the other, and each is fully God right, on their own, which is a mystery. That is the mystery of the Holy Trinity, and we don't understand it. It's, it's really tough to understand. I think the, a, a really good um, illustration, though, um, comes from light, right? So you have like a, a single ray of light, one ray of light, you have one God, one God. And you see the, the light possesses only, um, it, it is one characteristic. I don't know if you can say that. <laughs> but, but okay, if you put a prism up to the light, then you can see it separate into the three different primary colors, right? You've got red, and blue, and yellow, okay? And, and it's interesting because each of the colors is in the other color which, you know, we look at paint, which is subtractive, and that doesn't work. So don't think about paint, you have to think about light, which is additive color, and that works. Have you ever watched a play and there's like spotlights? Okay. Next time you watch a play, notice that when they have a red spotlight on something, and then a blue spotlight comes along, and they overlap. Do you know what I'm saying? The color in that overlaps is, is not purple. It's not purple, and what it, what it is, is it becomes closer to um, light. It's a lighter, lighter color. It doesn't get darker, it gets lighter, because there's a fuller light. What? Okay. No, not at all. No. And in fact, if you have three primary colors in terms of spotlights, and you focus them red, yellow, and blue on one, in one spot, what color is it? White. Isn't that amazing? It's white. And, and you, you can see it when it adds together. There's more, more whiteness, right? Paint, you're all thinking paint, right? That blue and red together make purple. But that only works with paint. It's subtractive color, okay? Additive colors through light. And that's what I'm saying that when you have light, right? This ray of light, it's one God. Within that white light are all the colors. They're all in there, which is cool, right? Black is the absence of light. There is no color in black. Right? There's nothing there. And, and so if you, if you think of light, when Christ says, I am light, like, I think that's, that's kind of revealing in that sense as, as an image. And, and even then, it's not a perfect image. There is no, no perfect image, but it's cool. It's cool. Anyway, um, okay, so in this one statement that we've looked at here in John 14, Jesus reveals how he is the way how he is the truth, and how he is the life, okay? And it's interesting because we can kind of um, associate each of these dimensions with um, a different person of the Holy Trinity. So if we say that Christ is the way because no one comes to the Father except through him, right? 
He is the gate. He's opened heaven. It's through him that we enter heaven. So Christ is the way. Which person of the Holy Trinity would you associate with the truth? The spirit, right? The spirit. And who would be associated with life? The father, right? The source of all life, who breathes into to Adam the breath of life, okay? And so I am the way and the truth and the life is in many respects, especially because of the entire section that we've looked at, a revelation of the Trinity, okay? It's a Trinitarian um, revelation um, that Christ is claiming in himself, right? And so whenever you speak of any person of the Holy Trinity, we need to keep this in mind because when you invite Jesus into your heart, right, he, he is intimately united within the Godhead with the, the other two persons of the Trinity, the Father and the Spirit. So they are there too. You've invited them too, okay? When you uh, receive the Holy Spirit in holy, in holy baptism, right? You are not just receiving the Holy Spirit. You are also receiving Christ and the Father, right? When you receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus in Holy Communion, you're not just receiving Jesus, you're receiving God because in his divinity, there's only one divine nature which is shared by the Father, Son, and Spirit, right? So does that make sense? So um, you are constantly receiving the entire Trinity in, in everything that, that you do. Um, let's go on then. Oh, I'm hoping some of that made sense because it's, it's just really tough. The good thing, the good thing is that um, if you understand it, I've done it wrong, right? So. <laughs> yeah. Okay, because um, the fact that the Trinity is the greatest mystery of our faith, right? And the fact that God is infinite and we are all finite, right? If a finite being, even if they are Einstein, right, or, or, or Anya, <laughs> okay. If a finite being can understand and comprehend God, who is infinite, something's wrong, right? Something's wrong. It'll never happen, in other words. But, but that's no reason ever to, to shirk away from trying to understand, because the neat thing about the word mystery, okay, a lot of people think of, of mystery as being a problem that you solve, like a, a murder mystery, right? Who done it? Okay, you figure it out and you're done. Theologically, a mystery is very, very different. A mystery is something that is infinitely knowable. Isn't that cool? Infinite, that you can keep learning and understand and comprehend something and then go deeper and deeper and there's more and more. And just when you think, is, you know, that you, maybe I, I've got my, you know, my act together and I've got a handle on this, there's still more and more and you'll never plume the depths. But you can always have a deeper understanding. And that is so worthwhile, getting that deeper understanding. That is so good. Because a lot of people say, oh, mystery? I won't even bother. It's a mystery. I can't understand it, so why bother? Right? And that's the wrong attitude. We need to bother because you can infinitely um, receive more. Okay? So that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Okay. Now, as soon as Jesus identifies himself as the way, when I am the way, okay, did you know that the early Christians... They, they didn't call themselves Christians right at the beginning. The, the title they used for themselves as a group was they were followers of the way. Isn't that different? Mm -hmm. right? And they capitalized the word way. And, and they understood the way as being Christ. They were followers of Christ, followers of the way. Okay, and I've added, um, I skipped some, but I, I used just three um, sentences from the New Testament where Paul is speaking. Okay, to, to demonstrate this. Acts 9, verse 1, says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. If he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he would take them as prisoners. Acts 22, this is after he has already become a follower of the way, right? And he admits, he says, I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women. And then verse tw uh, chapter 24 in Acts, verse 14, 
He says, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way. Okay? So this was the common way that they were referred to. And this was the, the title they had chosen for themselves, followers of the way. Okay? Now you probably have heard, um, uh, where was the place where they were first called Christians? Do you remember that? Antioch. Yeah. In Antioch, they were first called Christians. Um, you know what's interesting about the word Christian? Okay. It's got the word Christ in it, Christ, but that, that ending, right? Christian, that makes it Christian. Do you know what that ending means, literally? No. No, it doesn't mean when. It means slaves of. Slaves of Christ. And do you know how that title of Christian was given? Because we think of it as a very beautiful phrase, a, a, a beautiful name, right? And we, it was a derogatory term. It was an insult hurled at the Christians saying, you are slaves of Christ. He was a slave and he died on a cross. He died on a cross that proves he was a slave and you're slaves of him. It was mockery. It was mockery when they first were called Christians. But what's amazing, which I really like, is that the Christians said, Yep, that's true. We'll accept that. We'll claim that. And they liked it. It was not an insult for them to be followers of Christ, even though he was regarded as a slave in the world. Right? And there was no, no negative feelings from them. So they received this insult with tremendous pride. To bear the name of Christ became a source of joy for them. And to be slaves of Christ even a greater, even a greater joy, right? So it's interesting the way names get turned around, right? It's like, wow. Okay, so now they, they follow Christ and Christ is the way and they've identified Christianity as the way, okay? It's interesting here in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, right? You know the very next sentence, 12, 13, right? Uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians 13. I'm sure you all have that one memorized, but this one says, now eagerly desire the greater gifts and yet, I will show you the most excellent way, right? And uh, do you remember what follows next? I will show you the most excellent way. No? 1 Corinthians 13? How many weddings have you been to lately? None? <laughs> okay, that'll explain it. Uh, this is the whole discourse on love, right? Your love is patient, love is kind, yeah. love does not... You remember this. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love. If I have faith to remove mountains, but have not love. Right. So yeah, a clanging symbol, all that. This is the great discourse on love. And it's amazing because he comes, um, comes from describing all these amazing gifts of the Spirit, right? Some have the gift of prophecy. Others have the gift of understanding. Others are teachers. Others are, you know, and he's describing all these amazing gifts. The gift of healing, right? It's so cool. But he says, of all these, and some speak in tongues, right? That's where the tongues comes into. And then suddenly he turns and he says, but I will show you the most excellent way. All right, the most excellent way. And you know what? This way is accessible to all people. Not everyone has the gift of prophecy, but everyone can love, right? Everyone can follow this way. That's why it's, not only that is it, <laughs> but that's one of the reasons why it's the most excellent way. So yes, strive for those other gifts, he says, and yet I will show you the best way, the most important thing. And then in the end, he ends it, faith, hope, and love, these three remain, but the greatest is love. Okay. And so what's interesting is that now Paul identifies the most excellent way with love. Okay. Ephesians 5 says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Okay? So Christ is revealed to be God's example. Follow God's example. Right? As Christ did this, right? Loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That's what love is, in other words. That's what love is. Walk in the way of love. Later on, 
John, the beloved disciple, is going to write a letter and he's going to explain that God is love. Ah, so there you go. No conflict there. Jesus says he is the way. They're followers of the way. Paul says you got to follow love. Well, yes, the way is love. It's the way of love. It's Christ. It's the same person. Hello. Hallelujah. Okay, we're good. We're good. I, you thought I got all confused there and uh, no, 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 I knew what I was doing. Okay. Let's move on to truth. Okay. Psalm 145, verse 18. The Lord is near to all who call on him. <sighs> Isn't that beautiful? But wait, there's more. To all who call on him in truth. Uh-oh. <laughs> That's the big... Oh, okay. So you can't just call on the Lord and expect him to, you know, hop to it and satisfy all these desires I have, right? Tell me, and give me this, give me this, give me this. You have to call on the Lord in truth. Okay? In other words, when you say, Lord, I really need this, if you don't really need it, you're not calling on the Lord in truth. Okay? <laughs> so you're not going to get it. In other words, let me just put right now, you're not going to get it. Um, but it's amazing because truth becomes incredibly important. It, it becomes the way in which you communicate with God in truth. Okay. Well, let's go on and it'll, it'll become more evident. John 3 verse 21, but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. So we now have to live by the truth. In other words, it's a way of life. It's another. It's the way he has originally shown us okay, how to live. And now we've added the fact that the way is truth. Do, does that make sense? We're going to go, okay, a little further here. Verse, chapter John, chapter John, John chapter 4, verse 23. Jesus says, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Okay? Now, when we worship the Father, what do we do? We worship the Father in the Spirit, but it's through the Spirit that we are incorporated in Christ, right? who claimed to be the truth. Right? So it says, worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth which is Christ. Okay. So once again, we're not contradicting anything. It all, it, when, when we substitute these words for, for God, for Christ, right, truth and love, it, it more fully reveals who he is, just the essence of his Godhead. Okay, John 8. Now here is a really long statement again. Okay, John 8, verse 31. Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Okay. That's exactly what he had said earlier there in John 14. If you love me, keep my commandments. Hold to my teaching. Do what I have done. Follow this example. Live the way, the proper way. Okay. Um, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Right. And if we substitute for Christ, okay, then you will know Christ. And Christ will set you free. See how we can do that? It's kind of cool. They answered him. Okay, these are the oh, chief priests and the Pharisees and all the, okay. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Okay, they've taken offense. Is it true? Is it true that they have never been slaves of anyone? The Egyptians. Who else? Babylonians. Who else? Assyrians, Satan. 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 Okay, we're getting there. <laughs> yeah. Who are they currently slaves of? Romans. The Romans. For these people to stand there and say, we've never been slaves to anyone, right, is a bold-faced lie. It, it's a, I can't believe they've actually said that. How can you say we shall be set free? There's nothing to be set free of, right? We're not enslaved in any way. Well, Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Okay, so he skips all of those other um, nations and goes right to the heart of the matter. Okay, 
So everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the spirit sets, sorry, so if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Okay? You are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth. Imagine that. Oh. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. No wonder they wanted to kill him, right? <laughs> okay, he didn't um, beat around the bush. Not only did he say you're slaves, he went right full out and you are slaves because you're slaves of sin. Your father is the devil and what, yeah. No, no fear, no fear there. What's interesting is he identifies lying as a, the native language of the devil. Isn't that amazing? Okay, if lying is the native language of the devil and Christ is saying he is speaking the truth, okay, that would be the native language of God. Okay, you have two languages. Jesus is using this to explain why they don't understand. I'm speaking the truth. It's a whole different language to you. You speak lies. You don't understand what I'm saying. Isn't that an amazing way to, to under, understand this? Right? You're speaking a whole different language. And, oh, I just think he's so clear when he explains things. Oh, you gotta love him. Okay. Um, John 16. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. Okay. So they have received the truth now through the words of Christ. Through Christ who is the word. <laughs> cool. Okay. But they, the, the truth has not fully penetrated them. Has not fully become a part of them. Right? Because they are still in sin. So what needs to happen is that they need to be totally cleansed of sin so that the fullness of God's presence and God's truth can enter them completely. And once again, it is the spirit of truth. So it's through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that that takes place. Okay? We call that baptism, regeneration in Christ. Okay. John 17, 17. Okay, this again, it's the high priestly prayer of Jesus. It's amazing, all this stuff was spoken of right right before that Last Supper, okay? But here is, is a prayer of Jesus, the high priestly prayer, they call it, chapter 17. And, and here, he's speaking to the Father, and this statement here, he says, um, sanctify them, he's speaking about his 12 apostles, right? Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth, okay? Sanctify means make them holy, make them holy. So make them holy by the truth. The truth makes them holy, okay? Now, for those of you who were here for our amazing retreats, oh, oh, you're just a step ahead of everyone else, right? Because we had a, a great reflection uh, that Vicki gave, do you remember? Okay, and when she gave her reflection, we, we traveled with her through this the Last Supper discourse, right? And we. This is exactly what, what she was talking about. Um, sanctify them in the truth. In that last moment, Jesus spoke to Judas and Peter and the other 12, right? He was speaking to people who were going to betray him and deny him and abandon him. Okay? And when he speaks the truth, right, he makes them holy. He, think, think of, first of all, um, well, let's start with Judas, okay, who is planning to betray him at this time, right? He was looking for a time to betray him for his 30 pieces of silver, okay? And by speaking the truth to Judas, okay, uh, would you must, you know, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Right? Uh, what, what you are going to do, go, do quickly. What it, and, and, and it's interesting because 
when Judas realizes the truth of what he has done, I have betrayed innocent blood, right? He throws down that money, he gives, throws it back at the, the chief priests, right? But um, is he sanctified? Well, the truth starts to penetrate him, right? He's realized what he's done. We, we don't know how far it went. We, very likely, um, the fact that he despaired and killed himself himself is an indication that that truth didn't permeate fully okay? because that very last act that he he accomplished was a denial of the, the mercy of God right so, so turning your your back on the mercy and love of God is in a sense denying that truth about God okay? but um, but still he came to understand and realize what he was doing okay and that cleansed him in some sense of some sin, okay, revealed that truth. Peter, who denied Jesus, when he, you know, I will die with you, I, I will, you know, I would never deny you, I would die for you. Peter, you know, before the cock crows today, you will have denied me three times, right? Don't, don't think you're just oh so great and strong and wonderful, you're gonna, you're gonna, you know, fail me and when Peter realizes the truth of what he has done, you know, when he hears you know, the rooster crowing, um, he begins that process of conversion and, and repentance and sorrow. And, and, and finally, that process doesn't end until Jesus asks him three times, right? Do you love me? Do you love me? And then that truth he allows to, to enter into him. And the humility, the, the arrogance before and the humility after, what a difference. Right? In, in the character of Peter. But in the other 12 apostles, the same, you know, the rest of the 12, same thing. You know, you will abandon me. The shepherd will be stricken and the sheep will scatter. He tells them the truth. They know, and they're, you know, who, someone's going to deny me. He's surely not I. Not me. I'm, I'm much more faithful than that. And, and yet they all abandon him, right? They all abandon him. And so when they realize that truth, they are sanctified and purified by realizing the truth, not just of who they are in their sinfulness and in their weakness, but much more importantly, who Christ is in his mercy and his love and compassion for them. Right? Okay, so they are sanctified in the truth. And in the end, um, well, 11 of them become priests that night. That's cool. Your word is truth. Your word, the eternal word, Christ, is the truth. <laughs> okay. Now we get to the crucifixion, well, right before the crucifixion. Pilate, okay, you are a king then, Pilate said. The reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth, is what Jesus responds, right? Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Okay, so he, it's amazing how Jesus summarizes his entire mission on earth. His entire purpose for coming is to testify to the truth, the truth. Not just, once again, that through him we know the truth of God and the truth of ourselves. Okay? He is what each person should be. He is what we were created to be before we fell through sin. Okay? So, so that truth is something we need desperately. And Pilate's most famous response, okay? you all know this, what is truth? And you know that, that saying, he wouldn't know truth if it were staring him in the face, right? And there is Jesus standing right in front of him. He, he is the truth. And, and it's amazing because he keeps asking him question after question, and he gets these weird answers. But he knows that this man is not a criminal in any sense of the word, is not starting any insurrection, has not blasphemed in any way, right? All of the accusations, all these weird... Um, charges brought against him, right, are ill-founded. They're, they're totally without merit. And when he says, what is truth, right, um, it reveals the state that Pilate is in. The truth still doesn't matter, okay? What is truth? Who cares? In other words, I know you're innocent. I've declared to these people, right, how many times, right? Uh, over and I think six times he declares, he is innocent, or I see no guilt in him, right? Uh, he's completely innocent, and yet he condemns him to death. 
knowing he's an innocent man. And, and it's interesting, his wife, what was his wife's name? Starts with a C? Claudia. Claudia, okay. I always know the first letter, I never remember the word. Okay, um, Claudia is the only person, the only person in the entire um, story that did anything to try to, to save Christ, to rescue. A totally pagan, you know, foreign to everything. She has a dream. She's all scared because of this dream. She tells Pilate, don't have anything to do with the murder of that innocent man. Don't you dare do it. Good wife. <laughs> I don't like that. Okay, but Pilate, what is truth? What does it matter? Who cares? And he condemns an innocent man for his own sake, right? If you do not condemn him, you are no friend of Caesar. Right? And that that's what he's worried about, his own skin. Okay? Sad. Okay, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verse 15. Speaking the truth in love. We will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. Okay? So now our job is to speak the truth in love. Okay? That's what St. Paul is telling us. And um, what's interesting is, I, I wrote down there that uh, Pope Benedict's third encyclical, which came out this past, well, not that long ago, I guess this past year in the fall, I think. Caritas in veritate. Charity, or love, in truth. It's the exact opposite of, of this statement, truth in love. Okay? And what's interesting is that he says in this encyclical, um, we have focused so much of our attention on speaking the truth in love, being loving about it, right? Being gentle. Say, so, yeah, you two are uh, cohabitating, but and God is loving, God will forgive, and God will understand and all that. And we, we have emphasized being so loving and accepting and accommodating that we tend to mitigate the truth, right? We have, got, we have to proclaim the truth, but do it in love, do it in a loving way, okay? And Pope Benedict in this encyclical, he says, we need to realize we can flip that around the other way as well, okay? And when we love, it's not really love unless it's grounded in the truth. And it must be grounded in the truth for it to be love. And so he has, um, it's his social encyclical, which is just so beautifully written and really well, really well done. And, and in it, he says, um, we do a lot of things in, in terms of um, social outreach, right? And they are acts of love. But when we deny the truth, what we are changing is, is that love. And so there, there are women um, having abortions, and we, we don't want to use that language Right, that could hurt or offend or anything like that, and and so we stick to, um, you know, well, God will love you, God will forgive you, absolutely true, right? But what we do is we, we kind of hide what it is. It's a fetus. It's it's you know, we deny the fact of the truth that this is a baby, growing within you. This is a person. You don't have that right to kill this child. You just don't, right? And but we. We're so concerned about offending people and being politically correct and, and doing these things that we are afraid to proclaim the truth. And we need to be a lot more bold, I think, right? And, and euthanasia, right? You think of all of those life issues and um, things that need to be spoken of. You know, euthanasia, what a lovely, you know, mercy. It, it means mercy, you know. There's no mercy there half the time. It's in, anyway, getting off here. Okay, so um, speaking the truth in love, that's how we grow into people of Christ. Okay, speaking the truth in love. First Timothy, chapter 3, verse 15. If I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Okay, so here's St. Paul writing to Timothy explains what the church is. The church is the pillar and foundation of the truth, of truth. And so um, the church is charged with a tremendous responsibility. The truth, the truth that Christ gave, the truth of himself, how he revealed himself, the fullness of revelation which is Christ, which is truth, has been entrusted to the church. It is the pillar and foundation of truth. 
Therefore, the church's job is to, is to um, completely protect the truth, not let it get distorted in any way, okay? and pass it down through the years, through the generations, so that everyone has access to the fullness of truth. Okay? First John 3, 18. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Okay? So there's love in truth. That's the, what we were talking about with Benedict, right? Pope Benedict's encyclical, love in truth. Okay? First John 4, verse 6. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth. Isn't that interesting? And the spirit of falsehood. Okay? So how do they discern which is a truth and which is um, lies? Those that speak the same language. If you listen to the truth, right? Because the truth should resonate within each person. If you hear the truth, you should say, oh yeah, you know what? That makes sense. That's true. Okay. I'll change. Okay? Because if, if, the truth resonates with people. It makes sense within them. And that's how the apostles were able to discern when is truth being spoken and when are lies being spoken. Those who follow them. Okay. Genesis 2. Now we get to our last little section. And much of this has already actually been done. Um, but here we find out, you know, life, about life. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out, the, out of the garden, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And if you eat of that one, it leads to death. So you have life and death, two choices, okay? Deuteronomy 30, verse 15 says, See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. Okay? Deuteronomy 30, verse 19 makes it even clearer. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live, okay? I just find that an amazing plea. You know, you've got two choices, you've got two ways, two ways of life, and he's begging you. God is actually, please choose life that you might live. And you'd think he wouldn't have to plead so hard, right? We would naturally choose life, but we don't, we don't. Jeremiah 21, verse eight, furthermore, tell the people, this is what the Lord says, see, I am setting before you the way of life and the way of death. So now way and life are, are joined together, you see? I am the way and the truth and the life. Okay. Oh. John 17, verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Okay. To know God is to have life, eternal life to really know God. If you really know God, it is not possible for you to reject him. If you have a false understanding of who God is, then you could possibly reject him, right? And, and people are rejecting him all the time, right? But to really know God, how could anyone, oh, anyone reject? I, I suppose we could say, well, Satan did, right? He rejected God and he knew that fullness of knowledge, right? But, oh, the human person has been redeemed, right? We've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. We've been transformed. We have now should be able to, to perceive, right? Perceive that, that goodness of, of the life of God that is being offered to us. Um, First John 1, verse 2. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. Throughout that, every time you see life, you can so easily substitute Christ, right? And in fact, when you substitute Christ, it makes more sense, right? Okay, so let's do that. Uh, the Christ appeared, and we have seen him and testify to him. And we proclaim to you the eternal Christ which was with the Father, who was with the Father, right, and has appeared to us, okay? So Christ is our life. First John 5, verses 11 to 13. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. 
I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Okay? You have life because you have Christ. Okay? You have Christ. 1 John 5, verse 20. This is our last passage. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. So who is the he who is true? The Father, right? Okay. We are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Okay. So once again, the, you know, the Father and the Son and the Spirit all come back together. The true God, right? Um, does that make sense? Okay. Um, what we have here is, is Jesus taking three different words, okay? And, and he's picked them just so beautifully, right? How interchangeable all of them are. And he points to himself, right? And he says, I'm the way and the truth and the life, okay? In other words, whatever it is that you are looking for, it, if, if you're trying to figure out how to live, I'm your answer. If you're trying to comprehend the, the mysteries of the universe, if that's your way, right? If you're not, a, in other words, some people are practical people. They need an example, right? They need to follow a way. Show me how to do it and I'll do it. Other people are philosophers, right? You know, you know what I'm talking about, thinkers, deep thinkers. And they need to, before they do something, they need to really understand and get to the heart of the matter, the truth. And once that happens, once it clicks, everything else is easy. Okay? That's easy. So some people are practical, other people are more philosophical, and then there's people that just receive life and, and kind of fly by the seat of their pants, right? It's not that they need an example. It's, it's, it's not that they, they really think things through. It's more that they respond. You know? Do you want to go, okay? You know what I mean? Do you want to do this? Okay. It's, it's that kind of a person, right? That just wants to enjoy life. Like a child, like a child right? And, and it's, it's interesting, all three of those types of people, and we can look around the world, and seriously, you'll find these in your friend, right? These kinds of um, characteristics. But Christ is the answer to everyone, to everything. And, and this is the state, you know, when we say, um, I am the truth. And when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life, we can look at that statement and say, if you know God as the truth, you know God. Hallelujah. Right? You might not be able to, because of your own um, knowledge and, and limitations, know God as, as um, the way or the life. Because <coughs> my throat. Okay. So... <coughs> Let's just close with our prayer. Mm. Do you ever think that sometimes you're talking and the Lord's telling you, okay, enough, <laughs> shut up. You know, time to move on, Anya. <coughs> well, that moment has come. <laughs> okay. Mm. Yeah. So let's close with our prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, you are the way, the truth, and we ask, Lord, that you continue to lead us to yourself. Reveal yourself to us. Let us know you and love you. We pray that during this holy week, this holy week, as we enter into your Paschal mystery, that the truth of your love and mercy will envelop us and penetrate our soul so we might truly be able to unite with you. And we ask, Lord, that the union that you give us during this Paschal mystery last throughout our lives. Bring us to eternal life. We ask all this in your holy name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from Thank you for coming. We'll see you next week, our last week.